Hello and welcome to something a little bit different this time. Yes, I'm doing a top 10 of my favourite films from the 1930s, and just like humans who are 80 plus years old, they typically haven't held up well, are a little insensitive, and take a really long time to tell a simple story. By the way, this list is based on what I enjoyed and might change tomorrow. Also, it'll only include feature length films and obviously only ones I've seen. If you're wondering why a film isn't in the list, it might be because I haven't seen it. So let's start with... Gone with the Wind, that one film that your weird cousin does the disgusting mime for every time you play charades. It's me. I'm that cousin. Now this pick comes with a pinch of salt because while I did enjoy it and while I do think that it is a really well made film, it is four fucking hours long. In that time you could watch this video of the Texas Bee Works woman 53 times, and who doesn't want to do that, or watch Sting have half an orgasm. Yes, the length is an issue and it's probably a film that you feel more obligated than excited to watch, but if you can get through those four hours, it is a good movie with a lot to offer, especially considering when it was made and how much skill it took to pull off. However, and this is a big however, I've put Gone With The Wind in here based on my one and only viewing of it and my appreciation of the artistry involved in making it. I think I appreciate it on a technical level more than anything else. It isn't something I would watch again and it has a lot of issues, which means I can't put it any higher than this. All Quiet on the Western Front is a film about how war is often glorified and sold to young people with disastrous consequences, much like McDonald's or the Catholic Church. For the year it was made, it is quite the achievement, and in one of my earliest videos on this channel, which I implore you not to watch because let's just say I've learned a lot in these past nine months, I called it one of the first masterpieces in filmmaking because of the subject matter, the message, and the fact that it still holds up to this day, despite being made in a time when films like this were the norm. The way it portrays the reality of war instead of glorifying it, like later propaganda films would, and still do, is refreshing and harrowing. It truly is worth watching if you haven't seen it, and the sheer artistry earns it a place on this list. Robin Hood, a man in tights who fights for social justice and wants to give the money taken unfairly by the rich back to the poor. Essentially, the Daily Mail's worst nightmare. This is one of the few films in this list available to view in colour, which did actually contribute a little bit to it being on the list. After viewing over 130 films from the 1930s, you have roughly the opposite reaction as someone who lived through the 30s. Ooh, this one is coloured. Isn't that great? This is another film that has stood the test of time and is still watched by many to this day, mainly due to Errol Flynn as Robin Hood and the brilliant performances and filmmaking ability on display. It follows the typical story of Robin Hood as he is pursued by Prince John after defying him during a great scene at John's banquet in which he declares he will fight for equality. And if we've learned one thing recently, it's that you do not want to be someone who the royal family takes a disliking to because you chose to fight for equality. In 1995, the film was selected for preservation in the National Film Registry in the US and was deemed historically and culturally significant by the Library of Congress. Honours which pale in comparison to being number eight on this list, of course. Goodbye Mr. Chips, surprisingly not a story about the funeral of the catchphrase mascot, is a great film about an old man reliving his life as a teacher. From his first day in class up to the present day, including major milestones both personal and professional. Love, laughter, heartbreak, and an overarching message that a life lived doing what you love is a life well lived. As a teacher myself, this film gives me hope that I too can get to old age without being arrested for strangling one of the little shits. There really isn't much I can say about this film except that it is one that truly moved me and that I would recommend it to anyone who even has a passing interest in movies from this era. Pause this video and go and watch it. I'll wait. In fact, if you press the pause button, I kind of have to wait. That's how that works. Come to our freak show, come meet my monsters. Another film I've talked about in a previous video, but this time I wouldn't mind you going back to take a look at it. Centred around a circus show full of what the world has deemed as freaks, this movie focuses on telling the story of how these performers are real people with emotions and hopes and dreams who should be treated with respect rather than focusing on their conditions. Kind of like how when you set up your friend on a blind date, you tell the guy how nice she is to hang out with instead of mentioning that she spends five hours a day posting minion memes on Facebook. Often seen as a commentary on society in general, the film contains themes of discrimination, ableism, 
and class dynamic, with the common man being represented by the freaks, and the rich being the antagonists of the film, Cleopatra and Hercules. Some class freaks as a horror film because of the central plot of murder and act 3 of the film which utilises horror aesthetics and is filmed like an old monster flick, which places it in a weird category that has given it cult status. Either way it's a very interesting and forward thinking take on a subject that very few films of today treat with such care. I hadn't originally intended on including Fury in this list until I looked through the options and realised that it's one of the films from this period that had me hooked from start to finish. The story follows Joe Wilson, played by Spencer Tracy, an innocent man who is arrested on little evidence for the kidnap of a child, causing an angry mob to march through the streets, demand that the sheriff hand Joe over so that he can be lynched, and when he refuses, start a fire which they throw sticks of fucking dynamite into. The majority of the film centres around the trial for Joe's murder, who, unbeknownst to everyone, has made it out alive, leaving him with the decision of whether or not to come forward and forgive those involved, or stay hidden and let 22 people hang for his murder. A difficult choice, I know. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, the dynamite that blew up his cell killed his dog Rainbow. Now, I think I can speak for everyone watching when I say, stay hidden Joe, stay the fuck where you are because Rainbow deserves justice. Hashtag justice for Rainbow. The twists and turns of the trial and Joe's dilemma are genuinely interesting and keep you locked in for the entire runtime. Something that not many films from around this time do. This was one of the easiest inclusions in the list because not only does it have a great plot and tremendous acting, especially from Herbert Marshall, it also gave me hope that films from the 30s were actually worth watching beyond the more well-known ones which we're just about to come onto. We follow two thieves as they plan to rob the wealthy CEO of a perfume company made it ever more complicated by the fact that Gaston, played by Marshall, is falling in love with her. I won't say much more as again I've covered this in another video, but it gets number 4 on the list because it did genuinely make me laugh and intrigue me. I'd watched some truly awful films from 1929 to 31 by the time I came across this one, so this provided a nugget of enjoyment after so much dross, like the one bit of sweet corn in a pile of shit. Anyway, moving on. So we're into the top three and it's Snow White, a film that teaches us of the dangers of accepting fruit from strangers, but also the benefits of polygamy. You probably knew this was coming up in the list somewhere and here it is, the film that contains some of our favourite Disney characters, Doc, Sneezy, Grumpy and the rest. The story of a girl forced to live in seclusion because the Queen has a vendetta against her until she is found and is fed a poison apple, which is the second best way for a Queen to kill someone, the first being luring them to a tunnel in France. It really was a triumph of what animation could achieve when it was released and it has been beloved by children and adults ever since, with many of the songs still being played and referenced today. Weirdly, it was only nominated for Best Score at the Oscars and it lost. Realising their mistake, the Academy recognised it the following year as a significant step forward for animation and gave Disney an Oscar statuette, along with seven mini statuettes, which, as much as I get why, is a bit weird. Presumably, if they'd snubbed Titanic, they'd have sent Cameron a statuette that breaks in two halfway on its journey to him. And no, I don't think that joke is too soon, it's been 109 years, get over it. Disney actually used the profits from Snow White to build a new studio in Burbank, which is the same studio they operate from today, so essentially this is the film that literally cemented the foundations, which ended up giving us Toy Story and Cars 2. So, Snow White, we say thank you, but also, fuck you. The film that just misses out on the top spot for me is Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Directed by the legendary Frank Capra, it features some amazing performances, especially from Jimmy Stewart and Claude Rains. Controversial at the time for highlighting corruption in politics, it was called un-American and communist, and if history has taught us anything, it's that if Americans call something communist, then it's undoubtedly something that everyone would benefit from. In fact, Alban William Barclay, a man who looks like the living embodiment of crossing a mayo sandwich with ready salted crisps, said the film and I quote, showed the Senate as the biggest aggregation of nincompoops on record, a glowing endorsement of its historical accuracy. The climax of the story comes as our protagonist, the aforementioned Mr. Smith, uses the filibuster to stop a bill from the corrupt Senator Payne from passing, thus saving his town from corporate greed and giving Smith the ability to build his dream of a national boys camp, which, now that I'm saying it, 
sounds a lot sketchier than it actually is. The crux of the story hangs on this idea of the filibuster. If you don't know what that is, it's the act of talking continuously so that no business can be done. Essentially, it's a tool left over from the Jim Crow era, during which anti-civil rights politicians would use it to stop black people from being granted rights, making it an even more ancient racist tool than Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. This film is well worth the watch due to the fantastic performances, the brilliant plot, and the fact that it has held up so well over the years. It really could give a lot of modern films a run for their money. Yep, here we are, number one. This was extremely predictable, but that's because it is absolutely the best film from the 30s, and Judy Garland is amazing in everything. If you disagree with me on that, then you're wrong and I will fight you, and I'm bringing the entire LGBT community as backup. There really isn't much to say about this film that hasn't already been said. The story inspired by films such as Snow White before it, telling the story of a young girl far from home who discovers that the strength and the power she's been looking for this whole time has been hers all along, and that the real treasure at the end of the yellow brick road are the French ships that developed along the way. Yes, it's a plot and a message that is so sweet and saccharine that it gave me diabetes just saying it out loud, but it makes a fantastic story. Films that last this long and are still so popular after almost 90 years are that way for a reason. For The Wizard of Oz, it's the combination of the story, the characters, the acting, and the amazing technical work that went into making it. Not to mention the soundtrack, which is up there with anything else you could put up against it. In fact, if you're watching this video and you haven't seen The Wizard of Oz, first of all, I assume you must be a dog who accidentally pressed play on your owner's laptop, in which case, good boy. Second, Thank you for choosing to watch this over one of the most memorable films ever made. That's a huge compliment. And third, go watch The Wizard of Oz, because I'm pretty sure you're the last person alive who hasn't, and I'm including newborns in this. The Wizard of Oz is bright and shiny and colourful. Babies love that shit. Anyway, that's the end of the list and the end of the video. Please feel free to tell me your favourite 30s films in the comments or on Twitter, at GSYT Cinema. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.